evening's discussion will deal with the subject of 19th century capitalism. With us this evening are Kent Cuno of the staff of WKCR and Arthur Gandalfi and Norman Fox, two students at Columbia University. Mr. Gandalfi. Ms. Ryan, it is often stated that though capitalism gave the world a higher standard of living for a steadily increasing number of people, it turned the world inside out. Personal loyalties gave way to financial relationships. The wealthy man ceased to be the patron and of, the, of his poor neighbor. He became a mass man, very often with no purpose in life other than self-aggrandizement. How would you answer this charge? I wouldn't take that charge too seriously because observe the package deal and translate the terms used here in its actual, into its actual meaning. To begin with, if a wealthy man is to be uh, considered in charge of his poor neighbors, what is being referred to specifically is the feudal system. Uh, if uh, a wealthy man has to be responsible for his poor neighbors, he has to have power over his poor neighbors. And therefore, what the author uh, of this quotation uh, is indicating, but does not have the courage to say openly, because if he did, it would be rejected instantly, is that he prefers the feudal system to capitalism. Now, uh, when he says that uh, capitalism becomes a mass man, that is another uh, snide or slanted type of writing, which if you translate it into its realistic meaning, simply means that every man works for the widest market possible, that he uh, offers his values and his economic future is determined by the value of his product and the free individual judgment of those who want to buy his product or to trade with him. When you speak of a mass man in terms such as these, it simply means that you object to the fact of a free market, to the fact that every man as an individual can deal with as many men as care to deal with him and that every man has to offer his products or services to a mass market by which is meant a free market. Uh, it does not mean that the total mass of people will buy every product. It means that the, those who want to have a chance to. Point number one. Number two, what is here the question of uh, what is meant by the question of upsetting somebody's loyalties. Uh, obviously, this quotation refers to a set dogma which the whole of society is supposed to accept and from which nobody can deviate, and that again is a concept that could be conceivable only under a medieval feudal system. Under capitalism, one of its great advantages is that there are no set loyalties, that is, none set and prescribed by the state or by society or by the community. Each individual chooses his own loyalties and the individual who chooses rational loyalties of values is the one who will succeed. What the author here is trying to disguise is the fact that under capitalism every man stands on his own, is free to choose his own values or loyalties, his own occupation and to go as far as his ability and ambition will carry him. Therefore, if you translate the meaning of this statement into an exact, uh, concretized, realistic image, if you ask yourself what does it mean in fact and in reality, it means the greatest compliment that anyone could pay to the capitalist system. Uh, this quotation in fact criticizes capitalism for its virtues, not its flaws, and the implicit viewpoint of the author is quite clear. It is a, a medieval collectivist who resents the freedom and the individualism possible only under a capitalist system. Mr. Cuno. Ms. Rand, can a free enterprise system exist today in our present constitutional setup? And if it cannot, what changes are needed in our constitution? Uh, well, the... Uh, uh, first thing one we have to consider is what do you mean by the present constitutional setup? Uh, as the constitution stands today, it is predominantly ignored and evaded. The constitution today is only a very thin remnant which people observe 
more or less by the inertia. The Constitution has been infringed, negated, evaded on a number of occasions. And besides, the Constitution, even in its original state, had certain contradictions which had to work out, which had to lead to contradictions and trouble and a certain type of lawlessness in practice. Therefore, under today's Constitution, or to, put, to be more exact, the Constitution with its misinterpretations, with the contradictions made possible but by its original contradiction, the Constitution today is in an untenable position. And what we need above all is to clarify, reaffirm the original constitutional principle and remove the contradictions. The main contradictions uh, are, as you can see by today's uh, news, the uh, clause of eminent domain and more importantly, the uh, control in the, the interstate commerce, the clause giving the government power to control interstate commerce, which was not intended in the kind of way it is being used now, but which nevertheless were, was uh, stated too briefly and in too generalized a form, and therefore, in fact, has led to the exact opposite of uh, the original framers of the Constitution intentions. That clause was intended mainly to prevent individual states from setting up trade barriers so that we would not have uh, 13 frontiers uh, between states or 50 frontiers today. But instead of that, it has been used for the exact opposite principle uh, or purpose, namely to restrain trade and uh, to restrain all business and therefore consequently all freedom. It is that clause, first of all, that would need clarification, and there are lesser contradictions which would have to be uh, eliminated before the Constitution could be observed fully. However, observe this. Even in its imperfect state, the Constitution is the document which permitted this country to achieve the incredible progress it did achieve. It is an unprecedented document, and its results are unprecedented in history. Therefore, what we can be certain of is the basic principles of the Constitution and the idea of a Constitution as a limit on the power of the government are the sound, the valid, the proper philosophical political principles which we should follow. Uh, therefore, if you ask me, can capitalism exist under the present Constitution, I would say no, but neither can any system. Nothing can exist under a contradiction. But that contradiction it would not be too difficult to eliminate. And what we would need uh, when we come to political reform is a clarification of the Constitution and a removal of its contradictions. Ms. Ryan, do you think that the income tax amendment is a contradiction to the Constitution? Uh, yes because it gives an enormous, undefined, and arbitrary power to the government. Do you think that if the progressive feature of the income tax were removed, it would be uh, a contradiction? Uh, no, you see, in principle, I object to the income tax as such. Uh, now, I would not advocate a reform of the income tax as the first reform on the way to a free society, the situation is much too complex today to begin with that. I would not advocate abolishing the income tax immediately. But I would say that as uh, public opinion and public knowledge improves and moves toward a free society, sooner or later one of the reforms that would have to be passed is the abolition of the income tax as such. And ultimately the establishment of a system of voluntary contribution for the support of the proper functions of government. Now, there are many ways in which a voluntary, non-compulsory system could be established, but this is a plan for a very distant future. If the details interest you, I would refer you to an article of mine in the Objectivist Newsletter, where I discuss in detail precisely what kind of substitutes we could have for the income tax and how the support of the government could be made voluntary.
Mr. Gandalfi. During the turn of the last century, American industry underwent a process of concentration and merger. In many industries, great industrial combinations were formed, such as U.S. Steel, American Can, GE. Can, can a lazy fair society function if these monopolies na naturally grow in a uh, capitalist system? The error in your question, which is a very widespread fallacy, is the belief that it is a laissez-faire capitalism, a free market that leads to the development of monopolies. This is not true, and it is one of the very widespread fallacies uh, inherited originally from Karl Marx, who claimed that capitalism by its nature has to lead uh, to a few monopolistic concern running the whole economy with everybody else uh, reduced to the state of proletarians. As you have observed the development of capitalism, you can see empirically that this is not true. But to make the point clear, first of all, define what is meant by a monopoly. Properly speaking, uh, what is meant when people use that term is a coercive monopoly. That is a business concern which preempts a certain line of activity or production and bars all competitors, all newcomers from entering that field. This is a coercive monopoly because a non-coercive monopoly, that is uh, the situation where one company provides a service and no one else engages in that activity, is not uh, in any sense a social evil and cannot be considered as that. Because in that sense, every one of us is a monopolist. Every man has certain goods or services to offer which are his exclusive production and which other people cannot do. But this is not what is meant by a monopoly. You speak here of a coercive monopoly. It is a monopoly which closes the entry of competitors into a given field. Such a monopoly has never existed, neither in the United States nor anywhere else in the world, without the help of the government. It is not a free market, not let's say fair capitalism, but precisely its opposite, the intervention of the government into the economy that stands behind every coercive monopoly that has ever existed. It takes a special act of government to grant a special privilege, a subsidy, a franchise to a certain company or group of individuals and to bar all competitors from that field by law. If you are barred by law, then of course nobody can enter that profession and that constitutes a monopoly. If a few large companies combine, as in the example you gave, they cannot bar other companies or other men from entering their particular field. And one of two things will happen. If by combining they can offer better services, better goods at lower prices, than anyone else can offer, one would have to say more power to them. It is then to the advantage of everybody to deal with that company and not to have to deal with 10 less efficient companies that would give you uh, inadequate goods at higher prices. However, no matter how efficient such a con uh, voluntary monopoly would be, it would uh, be under constant threat of competition from the moment that it let down its standards or its efficiency. It could be a monopoly only so long as it produced better and cheaper goods than anyone else. A competitor could enter the market with a new idea, a new invention, and undersell them any moment. In order for that company to bar an abler competitor or an innovator, it would have to have a government action behind it. Uh, this has never happened uh, with uh, the companies that you mentioned. The combinations they formed were voluntary and proper, and there is no moral or political justification for suppressing or prohibiting combinations of that kind, because it is ultimately the free market that decides whether a, com a combined a uh, company of that kind will or will not succeed. If they do not succeed at being the best in the field, they will lose money and be forced out of the market, which has happened with large companies. Size as such 
is not a sign of economic power. For instance, to quote a recent example, or fairly recent, United States still almost held a monopoly for about 10 years uh, on the steel market until the rise of what was then called little steel, newer and smaller companies, specific republic steel and national steel in the early 30s. They were the first ones to come out with metal alloys and United States still had to uh, change its mode of production to compete with them, introduce new research, or it was threatened with the total loss of the market. Now that is a fairly recent example of what happens with large companies if they do not keep up their efficiency and the value of their product. Any large company or combination of companies of that kind can be destroyed on the free market by any competent newcomer. That is no threat to the economy or to the people. But what kind of uh, monopolies are beyond the reach of competition? Well, observe public utilities, electric light, telephone, all of which were forced by the government. During World War II, the government forced two telegraph companies, uh, Postal Telegraph and Western Union, to combine into one monopoly. This was done by government order, and you will find the same phenomenon behind any large business which controls a field exclusively. It is done by the intervention of the government. For further details, again, I would refer you to the Objectivist Newsletter, where we have uh, printed an article on the details of the situation, giving you further sources to read uh, on this subject. Uh, because both history and theory will demonstrate, if you look at the facts, that monopolies, coercive monopolies, are not the product of a free market. Ms. Ryan, would you say <coughs> that the, the existence of high tariffs in the United States during the last half last quarter of the 19th century led to these uh, giant, these great merges in uh, many fields of industry? No. Tariffs would not be directly responsible for that. There were various economic reasons. But I would say this, that the existence of tariffs is one of the early government interferences in, into the economy, which was uh, prompted or created not by labor or by the liberals, but by business. It was businessmen who were in favor of tariffs, and in that sense, they were committing economic suicide, as they can see today. Tariffs are a very improper form of government intervention to the economy, and uh, this was one of the early examples of such interventions started by the businessmen. Later, every other economic group adopted the same tactics and began to seek legislation favoring its interests. But under laissez-faire capitalism, the government would have to take its hands off the economy altogether and could not interfere with any legisl legislation in favor of any group, neither in favor of business, nor labor, nor anyone. Therefore, the question of laissez-faire is not whom does government legislation favor. Uh, proper laissez-faire capitalism is a system in which the government has no power to intervene into the economy and serves only as a policeman, not a regulator of business. Mr. Fox. <clears throat> Ms. Rand, in your pamphlet, Notes on the History of American Free Enterprise, you make mention of government land grants to the railroads. What I'd like to know is, uh, how could the railroads have acquired the land on which they built, if not through land grants? Well, to begin with, it was not every railroad that uh, got those land grants. It was only some of them. Uh, but the uh, railroad could, could and should properly acquire land in the same way as any business acquires any other property, by buying it. And a good example of such a railroad was the Great Northern, built by J.J. Hill without any land grants or any federal help. Uh, what I didn't understand, though, is from whom did they buy it? In unsettled land, for instance. Well, oh. unset if, if you mean government or so-called public land, well, there it's a question of how that land should have been disposed of. And in this sense, I would say that the Homestead Act, by which a man could acquire a farm of public land, 
by working it a certain number of years, by uh, cultivating it for five years, was the proper principle. Therefore, if uh, the government and the railroad builders at the time had been fully and consciously on the principle of free enterprise, they would have acquired the land from the government either by using it for a railroad for a few years or, if necessary, by paying the government. Uh, strictly speaking, you see, there is the question here that I do not think it proper to consider ownerless land government property. The government in that case is really only the custodian who should establish the rules by which private owners can acquire that property, because public property in this context is really a fiction. Uh, it is uh, not possible to practice, and in practice it results only uh, in the fact of bureaucrats disposing of these funds, to what, uh, giving them to whatever favorite uh, or aristocrat of pool they may choose to pick. Uh, but that's a separate question. If your question is, how should the railroads have asked? They should have purchased their land. They should have got private loans. And those that did, like the Great Northern, were the railroads that succeeded and had the best economic history. Most of the others got themselves into very terrible financial trouble, uh, and most of them even went through bankruptcy sooner or later. If you look at the history of railroads, you will observe that the railroads with the most successful and best economic history were the ones that had the least government help. Mr. Rand, a moment ago you were speaking about the forced merger of two telegraph companies, and it brought to mind the thought of what has often been called the natural monopoly. Do you think such an animal exists, and do you think that the public utilities are them? They've often been called that. Uh, no, that's a very misleading term. What uh, the only legitimate meaning that such an expression as natural monopoly could have is what I referred to earlier, that is a large company uh, doing all of the business in a given field because it is doing its business well and no competitor can do it better therefore uh, no competitor enters the field in that sense let's say if you have a small town that can support only one drugstore and you have only one drugstore you might call that a, a natural monopoly that is no uh, the population w would not require two drugstores but if the a town grew and the population grew that one drugstore could not keep other dr drugstores from entering the area and competing. Therefore, if by natural monopoly you mean uh, a situation in which no more than one man or one company is required to cover the market, well, yes, that can happen uh, and does happen constantly and there is nothing wrong with it. Uh, however, if you mean are there certain lines of activity which necessarily have to be in the hands of one company, such as the public utilities. No, that is not true. Uh, they could compete, and they did compete at one time. If, however, it were found by themselves that uh, competition did not pay them, such as the situation which did exist of two telephone companies, for instance, in one city, where it created a very difficult situation in communicating if you belong to two, uh, two different companies, in such a case, if it is found to be more economically profitable, which means more efficient and better for everybody, then two companies would merge. But there is no uh, a priori rule by which you could say that a particular line of activity necessarily has to be run by a single company. Mr. Cuno. Ms. Rand, in a laissez-faire system, isn't there a possibility that a monopoly would overcharge, and then if a competitor arose, that this monopoly could force out the competitor whenever it wished because of the monopoly's great size and power? In other words, if a competitor arose who could compete, then the monopoly would, let's say, lower its prices for a short time in order to drive out the competitor and then take over again and to charge higher prices. Yeah, well, that's the uh, allied fallacy, allied with the issue of monopolies and known as the price war. No, it couldn't happen. Or rather, price wars did happen, but the big monopoly could not succeed for a very simple reason. Uh, again, concretize what would happen in practice. 
If a large company wanted to get rid of competition in that way, it would have to take a loss for a while by selling its product at a loss in order to force the competitor out. Now then, when the competitor was out, the large company would have to gradually raise its prices in order to recoup its loss, in which case several new competitors would enter the field uh, and undersell the large company but just by just a little, which would represent a large profit for them, and they do not have any losses to recoup. Therefore, uh, now the big company would have to start undercutting them, and the process would go into infinity until the large, which would not be infinity because the large company would go bankrupt. The argument often used uh, in that field today is that things are just too costly for competitors to arise just as easily. For example, uh, in steel, if there was just one company ruling uh, the steel industry now, for a new company to arise, it would have to have a capital outlay initially, uh, a fantastic amount of money that most companies would not have. But you see, this is exactly why under capitalism things do not happen in the kind of way uh, uh, that the idea of price war implies. It would take a very long time for a company to drive out a competitor if it is a company, as you described, that in, in, in quire, requires a large outlay of money. Uh, therefore, if the tendency were in that direction, if it were seen that a large company is proceeding on that process long before they had driven out their first competitor, it is the investment market, the bankers who invest in new ventures, who would be making plans for establishing the future competition. Uh, precisely because the l large company would need a long time to succeed with its plan, the opposition or the future competition will have plenty of time to make its plans, and therefore one would not come actually to the real uh, setting up of new comp uh, competitors or destruction of old ones. No company wise enough to hold a, a large a part of the market would embark on a policy of that kind. And if you study economic history, you will see that no market position was ever won by means of price wars, such as were tried usually either peter out or ruin both parties involved. We have time for just one more brief question. Mr. Gandalfi. Mr. Ryan, are financial or industrial panics uh, essential to a capitalistic system? No. Again, I refer you to an article on this subject in the Objectivist Newsletter where we demonstrate in great detail and with uh, recommended reading and evidence to show that the large depressions and panic are the result of government interference into the economy, specifically of government manipulation of credit and money supply. That was the cause of the depression of 1929 and of all the preceding lesser ones. Again, it is capitalism that is taking the blame here in popular fallacy for the evils created by its opposite, by government intervention. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you, Ms. Rand, and thank you, gentlemen.